And welcome to Lone Star Yell Fight, where your favorite Aggie, Andy Tom Chesson, and your favorite Longhorn, James Christopher, take you deep inside the two flagship programs of Texas football. And welcome to Lone Star Yell Fight. We are here to talk a little Aggie and a little Longhorn football. Luckily, nothing has happened to make this show any interesting at all. First of all, we do have our local and favorite Aggie, Andy Tom Chesson. Andy, where are you coming from today? Uh, beautiful downtown Charleston, South Carolina, where college football is no longer re- relevant. Weren't you in Seattle last time we did the show? I was. Yeah? Wow. That was a week ago. I've been um, in Vegas, Seattle, San Francisco, New Jersey, snuck into Manhattan for a couple of hours, then headed to Charleston. Tonight I'm going to Chicago for a layover and then back to Houston for you know Thanksgiving week. Wow. It's like my wife's trips, except that she's been to cool places like the Valley and San Antonio. Well, anyway, um, we also have a special guest. We've got Reed here. Reed is host of In the Huddle with Reed. Reed, thanks for jumping on Lone Star Yell Fight. Of course. Thank you for having me. Um, We are going to jump right into the big news, which is Jimbo Fisher being fired. And I've talked to you guys both about this independently. Like Both of you saw a world where this could happen. Uh, Andy, we'll start with you. Are you shocked that it happened this quickly, or is this the only way to do it in the modern era of an early signing period? I mean, there's always shock when you're talking about eating a $77 million buyout. However, <laughs> Back a little yeah, less. don't choke on that. Um, however it's structured to be pay out, that's still a large chunk of money that the athletic department has decided to take on. Now, um, Based on different message boards, I have reason to believe that at least the initial 25% of that buyout that had to be paid out in 60 days has been picked up by a couple of generous alumni. Um, so that burden is not on the AD, but I don't know about the ongoing 8 to $9 million payment for the next seven or eight years. I wish St. Michael's would fire me and give me $70 million to go away. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's that's something that the athletic department, at least publicly, has said they're going to eat. I know there's been a bunch of... Uh, hand wringing from uh, various uh, elected officials around the state, talking about how many years of tuition that could buy, and how the ba- ro- bad the roads are, and how we don't have bridges. And um, frankly, that money's not earmarked for civil engineering projects. So uh, it, it is an unfortunate end to the Jimbo Fisher era. Uh, but as you said, the writing was kind of on the wall. It was a matter of when, and I do think we'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, I don't know how you have the combined two seasons that Jimbo Fisher has had in 22 and 23, and then you don't make a move with the early signing day um, in mind. And, and that's what I think ultimately drove it. You've got to keep that roster that you that you recruited in 22 as intact as you can, and that includes Connor Wigman and a couple other guys um, that are top of mind right now. And then you've got to try to hold on to your recruiting class that right now is ranked ninth. You've already lost a couple of members of it, and you're in danger of losing a lot more the longer this process drags out. So I think the timing drove the decision in addition to just the general lack of performance and and disconnect ultimately from the AD to the coaching staff. I feel like for us, this has been the focus of all of our conversations in class, much to the chagrin of your fellow students. Every walk into back and forth to mass, we've talked about whether this was going to happen. Um, I can't remember which one of you thought was more likely, but are you shocked that it happened when it happened and how it went down? Um, I would say I'm not shocked because it's kind of one of those things where you can't keep expecting something to change when it doesn't. And I kind of talked to you about this. Like, I love the way they handled the situation. I mean, like you look at LSU firing Coach O, that kind of leaked out two weeks before they're going to cope. They're going to fire him. Then they didn't fire him that season. They fire him next season. It's like you you play this little game and it, it goes on and on. It, it just looks so bad on your program. So I like that you know no matter the outcome of that Mississippi State game that they made it like the board made their decision that week and they they carried out on it. So I I love how he handled it. Um, but I, I think you know to credit what he was saying um, to do this before transfer portal season is uh is brave is brave, but we'll see how things play out. How much of it is, guys? Um, You know, I I remember when Mac Brown got hired oh so many years ago, and he said the first recruiting job he had to do was to get Ricky Williams to not go pro. Um, Now it's like that times 11, because with the transfer portal, you really are recruiting, right? Read all the same players that are already on your roster. Yeah. Andy? 
Well, I mean, you've got a guy on the AM roster. Um, and I, I don't know that he's leaving anywhere, and I would honestly be surprised he would, but uh, Gabe um, Brownlow Dendy, who was a five star recruit, we sw- flipped him from Oklahoma in the last couple weeks of the signing period, who has not started a game yet. He'll be going into year three next year. Um, he'd be a prime candidate to kind of walk. And, you're, and it's not that he's a bad player. It's that we've got really good players ahead of him, and he's just down in the rotation. Um, you're in real danger of losing a Walter Nolan and Evan Stewart. And I'm throwing out the best names, not because I think they're necessarily going to leave, but those are the guys who are going to try to get poached. I know many Texas fans that I talk to are convinced they're flipping Evan Stewart at some point during this offseason, and he'll be in Austin. And it's a little far-fetched for me, but um, there's not a lot of traffic between those two schools once somebody's enrolled. Um, there's a few of us that we've done that, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, um, you, you've got to take care of the roster you have. And that's one of the things that I think Jimbo fell behind on. Uh, I think he's a very good coach for 2003. I don't know that he's a good coach for 2023 because the game has changed so dramatically really in the last three years. Um, but certainly, um, since the transfer portal opened up with unlimited transfers um, with having players being able to start immediately. And then with NIL on top of that, I think NIL, we were quick to respond to. I think the transfer portal Jumbo has been very slow to respond to. I want to, I want to look back for a second and we'll start with Reed on this one about where it went wrong because and I, and I'll paint the picture for a host of our show. Uh, he records his show next to me and he's always very loud and then when a and loses, he's louder, and you can, and it's kind of funny. We'll all sit out here and let's listen to him get fired up. But um, when did you start feeling like, because y'all, are, neither of y'all are knee-jerk guys, right? Like there are Longhorn fans that will fire Sark after OU, right? Yeah. Uh, when did you start feeling like, okay, this might not be a fit? Um, I, I think after, really after a couple of years, I feel like as an Aggie fan, I feel like other Aggie fans too, it's kind of like this thing where, it was like the first year, it's like, oh, he's getting settled in. Second year, you know, oh, he doesn't have the players he needs. And it gets to a point where it's like Jimbo has all the talent. He has all the money. He has, like, he has, every, he has every single piece to win a national championship. So we're lacking in one thing, and that's got to be coaching. So, I mean, when you, when you look at that, it's like then you have to overturn the staff. I think um, – Luckily, we weren't using that camera that just fell. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, – I mean, you, you look at what he's done in his career, and apart from the seven-time overtime uh, – uh, LSU game, apart from the Alabama upset, apart from these big games, he really hasn't done much. So it's kind of like the thing that I mentioned earlier. It's like you can't expect um, you can't expect him to start writing a different story when since day one he's pretty much done. Yeah, it's a definition nothing. of insanity, right? Yeah, but I think it. that's kind of the the trick that he lured me into is like we would we would go about eight and four every year, but we would have that one Alabama win. It was like, oh, could we play like that next year? <laughs> Gosh, we're going to be good. It was kind of that kind of thing, I think. What about you, Andy? Like, when did you start to feel, okay, this might not be the right direction? I mean, last year. And that's easy to do during a five and seven season. But there's no excuse, even with injuries, even with whatever was going on to lose to App State in your home stadium. And that was very simply Jimbo Fisher deciding that the way to win is the – his way to win is the only way you can win. And I'm not going to do anything differently. We're just going to keep beating the same plays that aren't working into the line and hope – that it's going to work out um, you, you that team, even with the injuries, even with having all those young players uh, suffered because he was slow to understand what the transfer portal looked like. He lost some depth. He didn't have any seniors. And in year four, that's problematic. Right. Um, you know, and I think the pressure's raised when somebody gives you a 10 year extension on top of your 10 year contract and gives you a raise after going nine and one. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent, I would have taken the money, sure. But at, at some point, dear God, I would like to prove to you that I too can handle a seven million dollar race or whatever it was producing for that kind of money, right? And if he is making five million dollars a year, you kind of go, okay, yeah, we're an eight and four team, and that's what we want to spend like. Um, but we're not it, to Reed's point, there is no piece that AM has in their program that is lacking, that isn't in the top two or three in the nation, whether you're talking facilities, whether you're talking NIL program, whether you're talking recruiting machine or recruiting hotbed around it, all the things that a coach says they have to have to win, school sport is there. 
So what's missing? Well, it's got to be the coach who won't change the things he's been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that t- t- just to y'all's point is there's one of the things, there's a couple of things that our schools have in common. One of which is a buttload of money. Like not, I don't think that every school can, can swallow a $70 million buyout. I don't, I don't know that I don't know that I can count maybe Notre Dame, like a school like that. I don't know many others that can I think Notre Dame would. Well, they wouldn't, but wait, can you, and should you, those are two different conversations. Um, obviously the power brokers at A&M decided that they, they can because they had the money, but they should um, because the program is stagnant. So they answered the Jeff Goldblum question from Jurassic Park with a yes. 100%. All right. Old people get that reference. Reed, your thoughts on that? I mean, the, that. Uh, I, I mean, I agree. I, I mean, the position that A&M is in, and that's kind of like to to our point now is is literally Jimbo had every single piece. He had every single he had every single piece and uh he just didn't play him the right way. And it comes down to it again. I mean he's gonna and also it's kind of like a conversation of who's Jimbo is gonna get picked up by. He's definitely gonna pick up a coaching job. Maybe not sure. the magnitude of Texas AM, which is disappointed because I really felt like he could do great things there. Um but I, I think that kind of leads us into who is you know AM gonna pick up and the biggest question is you know, are they going to pick up someone good for us? Because we've had two bad coaches in a row. It's like a third one, you know, come on, guys. Well, I do want to get to the, to the the candidates, but I have one more question about just the Jimbo thing. And one of the things that we talked about on our show is looking what college football looks at, looks like three, five, ten years down the road. And there's been this – it's it's changing. How much of does the impending, the SEC getting a lot bigger, heading towards what we believe is going to happen, Andy, of this sort of – 64 team we're our own thing now we're not really part of college football how much of all of that maybe accelerated the Jimbo firing and Andy we'll start with you on that I mean we would love to say that it has nothing to do with any of those things we're just charting our own course and doing what's best for us but anybody telling you that Texas coming into the SEC next year coming off what's potentially a playoff run this year um, you know if Everything falls in Texas's favor and a couple of things, you know, there are a couple of teams do have to lose ahead of you for you you guys to make that final four this year. So it's not a given, but start coming in at what nine and one right now or 10 or eight and one. You've got two more games uh, plus an S era big 12 championship. And then we fire our coach and those two teams are playing at Kyle field next year at some undisclosed date because we don't know if it's Thanksgiving or whenever. Um, that, that drives a lot of our activity. It shouldn't. We should be beyond that. And I don't think that's why you fired Jimbo Fisher, but I think that's where some of the urgency came from. I would love to sit here and say that, oh, no, it's because we looked at ourselves and saw that we were lacking. Uh, and I do believe that Ross Bjork was sincere in his press conference, which I was really impressed with, about taking the um, responsibility for the things that had happened, claiming to have made the recommendation, which I don't, I don't doubt. I don't know why I said it that way. Um, and kind of owning the process going forward. And, and that's kind of a really big step for AM because I don't know that we've had an athletic director who in the last six coaches has really been in charge of the football coach. Oh, okay. Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher did not answer to Ross Bjork. Uh, he answered to John Sharp and the big donors that were writing the checks. And that creates kind of a, a little sense of dissonance within the athletic department. And you don't have a lot of oversight when you're Jimbo Fisher, which I think is part of the problem. Nobody was able to check him and say, look, your offense is antiquated. You can't keep doing what you're doing and expecting it to start working all of a sudden. You've crippled three quarterbacks the last three years. You can't keep, you're not, Kellen Mond's not around the corner who just happened to miraculously never get hurt. Um, you're killing quarterbacks. Your recruiting is going to start suffering. You're not scoring points. You're not winning games. Nobody was there to tell Jimbo Fisher that and point out that your job's kind of on the line for it. And, and I think if you're Jimbo Fisher, a little bit surprised at how it turned out because there is no reality check in that world. You have $100 million in your bank account. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, and I want to get Reed's take on the changing college football thing, um, but it is a, again, I'll go back to before Mac Brown was hired, when you have donors running amok it's the whole bbs in the box convincing them to go in one direction is essential for a program like ours to be successful right like charlie i mean charlie strong will tell you nobody backed that guy and so therefore 
whatever problems he had were multiplied. Red Red McCombs wasn't on board. I don't no. recall. No, he thought he'd be a fine uh, defensive coordinator. <laughs> Maybe you yeah, have fine defensive coordinator. Um, but Reed, like, how much of it do you think is is college football seems to be changing by the minute? Do you think that factored into A and M making the decision now? It, it's impossible to say how much it factored into it, but I think it definitely does have a factor. And I mean, the, the changing playoffs and everything has a big factor. I, I think a a huge factor in Jimbo's time here. And I think this kind of goes back to what he was saying. He was a great coach in 2003. Is this NIL stuff and all this? This is very new. This is yeah. very like these coaches, like, and the problem is Jimbo obviously adapted to it. We had that, you know, record breaking class. And in a lot of ways, that class is a complete blessing to us. But in a lot of ways, it was a curse, right? I mean, we had, all, we had a max, uh, we had a mass leaving of everybody. We had some, you know, morale problems with some people, behavior issues on the team and stuff like that last season. I think that hurt a lot, especially kind of angered me after that lost Appalachian State. It came out that kids were partying before the game. And there was a kind of there was a bit of a culture, bit of a culture problem uh, in, in the locker room. I felt from an outside opinion, of course, I wish I could be I wish I could be yeah. in there and see myself <laughs> right. from an outside opinion. Um, it, it seems like that things were not uh, quite balanced, but I, I would say. I would say it's got to have some factor because it seems like what Jimbo's doing now is not working. And, you know, we go in and we play Texas next year. And that's, that's pretty scary, honestly. I mean, the first game back with a rival really like, especially a home game uh, it's, you know, where we need to make a statement uh, with all the talk with uh, they can't handle the sec, which is looking less and less true as Texas continues to play. So it's got um, McIntyre, if you're listening. <laughs> So uh, I would say it's hard to say overall how much it's it's affecting, but it's got to have some kind of factor because I would reckon that uh, that Jimbo is just not adapting to this new this new way of college football. And you're right too about culture. I think one of the biggest issues Sark dealt with with Fort first year was Tom Herman had no culture in that locker room except for what color your pee was supposed to be, and then at that point he was all over you. Um, okay, coaching possibilities. Uh, we'll start with Reed on this one. Is there a type of guy? Is there a guy? Um, what are you looking for? Or do you have some candidates in mind that you think this will be uh, who it'll be? And when do you think they'll be in place? Uh, yeah, no, how how soon? We'll see. Uh, but I, I think the interesting thing to me about a job like this coming open is I talked to you about this, but this is like a priority coaching job. This sure. is this is a top five job in college football, I believe, because we have the money, we have all the resources. Like, if you are a great coach, any great coach can come in here and technically really win a national championship very quickly with the assets you have at Texas A&M. So, uh, yeah, contrary me, to my fellow Longhorns perspective, this is not a uh, stopover job. Like, a and is a job you get to and you yeah. stay. Uh, That's and, always yeah, I know that. Uh, like, fire you. <laughs> I know that. Uh, Josh Pate kind of said something to this, which is a college football uh, podcast I listened to, but he said that like, this is such a priority job that people are going to be in the mix that are possibly going to get hired for this job that you would just never believe. Cause it really is that big. Mm -hmm. And we have that much money. You really don't know. Um, I I've got my top three candidates myself. I've got UTSA coach. I think Texas recruiting huge. And also like with Texas, Oklahoma joining the sec. I just think, who who is going to dominate recruiting when Texas joins the SEC is going to really because I mean you look at Texas they have everything you kind of want with recruiting they have the NIL um, they are the you know, upward program great coaching staff as of right now and uh, and really there's nothing that really Texas is lacking I would say so when you join the SEC and now you're in this you know you're in this big conference it's like what what's going to pull players away from that so I think recruiting's huge for him uh landing i've heard is a possibility from oregon which i think he's an amazing coach i doubt it because i know like before last season he was talking about wanting to settle down in oregon and plant some roots there i so mean they give I him doubt. all the money with no expectation that's hard to uh yeah and, and oregon's on the upwards right now oregon's playing really good they've got really good things going over there so i doubt that um but a big one for me which again little possibility because the lions are he kind of turned that program around yeah. dan campbell would be like insane to me because i mean you talk about an ex aggie coming in and really i feel like he could really define a culture at AM, like really uh define like a winning culture and uh i, I think that would be huge but lane kiffin is another big name how funny I, would that be i am a i'm a big i'm a big fan of lane kiffin just because i think uh recruiting wise and everything i think he's a big name he's a personality and i don't feel like he's a personality necessarily a bad way 
I know there's some there's some conflict going on there with him getting sued and everything right now. So that might know, yeah. I don't know the newest update on that, but um, yeah, that's kind of what I've got. Andy, what about you, man? I mean, again, I I know that you agree with the Jeff Trailer assessment as well. Um, to an extent, uh, and I don't want to uh, uh piss on um Reed's Cheerios here. Dan Campbell's already turned down the job. Um, he was at least approached. Uh, Dan Lanning has a buyout that's $20 million on paper, and then it's probably another $20 million because Nike has given him some level of ownership in Nike to stay at Oregon. So that you're talking yeah. about, yeah, I mean, it's some weird ass, like kind of like what, um, oh, I've lost his name, TCU did for their last head coach, where you could never poach him because he had some oil field futures that were tied to the job and it wasn't reported income. It was just a whole thing, but there's, Basically, the numbers that are organized coming out about Dan, it's it's organized if you want Dan Landing, you're going to have to come up with fifty million dollars plus on day one. Yeah, that's before that's before his salary. Um, Deion Sanders is also not going to be a coaching candidate, although he um, isn't going to publicly turn it down. There's a couple of people who are probably out but haven't been confirmed out. Marcus Freeman from Notre Dame. If you want to talk about names that people wouldn't expect. Uh, why would the Notre Dame coach leave? Well, he might leave because Notre Dame screwed him over on his offensive coordinator hire this past season. Uh, mm-hmm. They let Tommy Reese go to Alabama with no fight and wouldn't let him hire who he wouldn't let uh, Freeman oh, hire yeah. who he wanted to hire. Um, and he makes five million dollars a year. Yes, again, Notre Dame has some other ways they pay coaches, but he's affordable. Uh, Glenn Schumann is probably out because there's not the feeling. Um, that he's quite on the Dan Lanning track yet. He's younger. Um, he didn't play college football. He's been basically a graduate assistant and assistant starting at 18 years old, which is great, except you don't have that kind of on-field experience that some programs are going to look for. So I think those are some of the candidates that I heard real early that are probably not in there. Um, you mentioned Jeff Trailer. You know, I go back and forth on this because – if you really look at it, yes, he's got UTSA competing at a high level for Conference USA. Um, but he hasn't really done anything outside of that. He's taken three star players in Texas that weren't wanted by the larger programs and made them a winner. And could conceivably that work? Yes. Um, he's going to recruit Texas, except not all Texas high school coaches love him. He coached 10 years ago. It, you know, there's some, there's some questions there. So, and a and has been a national recruiting team for the last five years. Yeah. I don't know how that, I don't know how Jeff, Jeff Trailer um, manages Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia recruiting, and that's going to be necessary in the SEC. A uh, couple of names that weren't mentioned, uh, Kalen DeBoer out of Washington. Uh, there's a lot of heat on that name right now. Uh, he could be affordable. He doesn't have a huge buyout, and all he does is win games. He's 111 in his coaching career. Wow, and there's a wonderful article on the internet. As soon as you look that up, about he remembers every eleven, every one of those eleven losses, and they haunt him. Uh, we didn't mention Mike Elko, who probably uh, in some circles is the favorite, and a lot of that is what A and M fans love to do. I don't know if Texas fans do this quite as much, but if you're a guy who ever used to play or coach at A and M, you are going to get talked about as the next coach or a coach at A and M. Give There's me still that win, hundred percent. <laughs> that win owns Ch- Chick-fil-A's in San Antonio, but there are people who say, well, he'd quit all that and come be the coach, except he hated coaching. He doesn't like recruiting. And he's <laughs> one of those He's one of those guys that you're not as good as me, so I can't tell you how to do the things I did. I mean, that that's, you know, yeah. Aaron, Glenn's, Aaron Glenn's been mentioned. I'm sure Bucky Richardson would be mentioned if somebody thought about it, but that's it's a lot of that kind of play. Um, I don't think Elko would be bad. Recruiting, again, is a question for me. Uh, Jed Fish has been mentioned. Brian Hartline starting to get some heat, uh, who's the offensive coordinator at, at Ohio State. I think it's wide open right now. Did um, you see a Petrino promotion? No, I, I don't think Petrino. I, I don't think Petrino and Durkin are likely to be given shots. I, I think if you do look internally, it's going to be the guy they named as the interim, and that's Elijah Robinson. But that's going to be a situation where we didn't really like what we heard from these other candidates, and this might work for a few years and maybe Elijah Robinson grows into it, but he's yeah. kind of got the same problem as uh, Glenn Schumann does. He's been around a program, but he's been around a program that does things the wrong way. Um, unlike Schumann, uh, how much did he learn? How much does he recognize needs to be changed? Uh, you don't know until you know, 
Um, he'd be a, a real force on the recruiting trail. That's his primary function, but he's never been more than a defensive line coach. So you worry about now running a program the size and the magnitude of Texas yeah. A&M in 2023. Um, as far as timeline, you're not going to hear anything for the next two days. I know interviews have happened uh, mostly. That nobody's flying in. So people who like to do flight aware checks, that's not a thing anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Reed, I don't know if you're if you remember this. Uh, it might have been a little bit before your time, but that's how we used to find out that coaches were interviewing because they didn't know how to mask their flight aware numbers, and they'd fly from someplace like Columbus. Yeah, like that's or, when Saban came to Texas. Apparently, his wife met a real estate agent while he was interviewing. Yeah, everybody. Francioni, Francioni flew from Tuscaloosa to College Station to interview, and everybody knew it because <laughs> yeah. why would there be a plane going from Tuscaloosa to College Station? Uh, they don't do that Another anymore. Zoom. You've had you've had a round of Zoom interviews. I think one of the uh, accounts I follow have mentioned a few people have already uh, interviewed that we've talked about. I think you're going to start seeing some face to face interviews start happening after the games this weekend. So as early as Sunday, and Sunday is usually a good time to bring people to campus because it's quiet, quieter. Um, I really think this all is done the week after Thanksgiving. So in time to at least get a hold of that recruiting class and say, yeah, um, well, the portal, the portal is technically open now for A&M players uh, because you get 30. If you fire your coach, you get 30 days. I mean, it's right. It's 30 days from the day he's fired. So we've had one player announce that he's transferring freshman receiver. I'm not sure what okay. you wait to see who the hire is before you transfer, but but you don't have to leave. I'm not an 18 year old kid. Um, yeah. We, uh, because we have, uh, you get, to, you get to put your tweet up and say, Hey, look at me. <laughs> All right, real quick, we have to get to some. Uh, we got to get to some Texas rival, some Texas rumor stuff. I know we have a few minutes left. Um, there is talk of Quinn Ewers staying. What that means for Arch Manning, I am not a knee jerk guy. I um, do not believe for a second that the Mannings who put this plan together for him at Texas counted on him leaving. Necessarily counted on Ewers leaving after this year. However. And I want y'all's take on it. But as a Longhorn fan who had to pick one or the other, do I want to roll into the SEC with a redshirt junior Quinn Ewers or a redshirt freshman Arch Manning? I'll take the redshirt junior and figure out the quarterback position if he does leave. So I'm not I, again. I don't. I know I'm not worried about Arch Manning leaving. Burn that bridge when we get there. But for me, if I had to pick one or the other, I would take the veteran over the rookie. Yep. Uh, Andy, you want to go reply to that, or do you have? I was going to give it to Reed first, but um, oh, we can go first. Uh, go first. I think personally, it's it's kind of great for yours to say. I think Arch Manny with another year behind him, just learning, facilitating that is great. Um, I know I watched a ton of his uh, a ton of his practice footage because I was just so interested when he when he did not go to Ole Miss and did not go to Georgia. I was just very interested in what pulled him there because y'all have a lineup of obviously Malik Murphy, not you know. Not we we thought he was a little we thought he was a little better, (laughs) but you look at that y'all you look at your QB room and it is it's stacked up. So I think it's best that you guys go with yours again. You've got that experience. It's gonna be great in SEC. He's got the leadership on the team. It's a stated. It's gonna be great leading on to SEC. I think it's great that Manny's gonna learn another year behind him. Um, and I think worst case if he leaves. I think that you need to remember that you're Texas University and you're going to find yourself a quarterback. I love how you still you threw the <laughs> I love how you threw the jab in there too. I love that. That's good. That so, was smart. Um, yeah, I, I I don't think he's leaving. I really don't. Yeah, I I don't think the Mannings. I don't think that they are approaching his career like a typical eighteen year old. There's kid. no way they would have assumed. Yeah, I feel yeah. like they went into it knowing that. There was knowing how did, how would how would ability of you or staying? How would Arch leaving affect Cooper's um, student housing development on the West Campus? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there you go. I don't know. It's uh, So, Andy, you feeling uh, – what, what are your thoughts on whether he stays or goes? Uh, I Ultimately, I don't think it matters for your program. I, I, he, Arch Manning I'll is a name. Take Longhorn fans to start saying he sucks all of a sudden. Oh, the second that he announces he's transferring? <laughs> I mean, that that that's a given. Um, to answer your original question, it would be much better for Texas to go in with a third year quarterback than a first year quarterback. Um, I don't care what Arch Manning's pedigree is learning to read defenses in the sec is going to be a tougher challenge than somebody who's played games 
learning, just is seeing things yeah. he's already seen before. Um, and that's we don't common play defense in the Big Twelve. Well, I mean, that's just common sense, right? And you could take any two quarterbacks. The more experienced quarterback is generally going to be able to deal with adversity better earlier. Uh, taking nothing away from Arch Manning, but he's a kind of an unknown quantity except for his last name. Because to Reed's point, if you watch some of those high school highlights, he's playing the equivalent of 3A Texas football in New Orleans, New Orleans Catholic League football. Everybody he's playing with is about a foot shorter than him. Everybody he's playing against is a little bit less than that. They all weigh about 150 pounds, you know, if I'm estimating on video. So it's not like he was playing top flight competition. Another year in a system as a backup when he still has four years of eligibility, um, that that's not – I don't see that being a detriment to him. And I don't think the Mannings are the panicky type of family. I don't think Cooper is dumb enough to pull his son – out of a program that has a chance to be pretty good in an initial run in the SEC uh, to go probably someplace lesser. Cause I don't know who he's got no film at this point. So you don't know what you're getting. If he just enters the transfer portal other than a name. Uh, I think the guy you're in danger of losing is Malik Murphy. And you, however you may feel about that. Again, you're losing some depth. Um, yeah. I think, I think one of those two guys is gone. If you were stays and that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. I don't think they're both gone. The clock is ticking on Murphy, and he, I think he's he would be more valuable on, on a short term to another lesser program. Um, and I think, you know, he if he has pro aspirations, uh, he's running out of time to prove it in college. Yeah, uh, fair. Um, okay, yeah, we do want to talk, uh, you know, my thoughts, Texas, Iowa State. Look, um, we, we need to dive into it because I have a question I want to get to. But um, it's a trap. I mean, Texas needs to go in prepared. Iowa State. At night, I know that you, 10 years ago, that was a joke thing to say, Andy. Oh, Iowa State at night. Better watch out for nothing. Big game. Um, and and Sark's not – they've not really done a good job of closing out in the second half, so they need to do better. What I want to hear from you guys, though, um, do we care that the rivalry is back? Um, I am – I've always been the one that I've never felt like – you and I, Andy, I rose on the same page of I never really cared that that we weren't playing anymore. Um, so, Reed, the rivalry's been gone 11 years, right? Mm. So you really don't have – you've had more of your life without it than yeah. with it. Yeah. Your thoughts? Um, As someone who has no ties to the Big 12, I don't really care. I, I, I don't think it's a game that uh, everyone's going to be begging their moms to turn on the TV. Uh, but I think that it's kind of like something special about the Big 12. And I'll give you all reference. Everyone talks about, you know, Texas dropping these games. They shouldn't drop every year. To a certain extent, the Big 12, I feel like, is so special because of how competitive it is. I mean, if you look at those teams, every team almost is in the running to play Texas in the Big 12 championship. I mean, yeah, like yeah. it is a very, very competitive. It's not like the SEC where you have your big dogs on the top and then you have Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt. bottom crying in a ball. You yeah. know, it's it's not the same. So as we've watched the Big 12 <laughs> currently redefine their tiebreaker rules as we go. Boy, that's a clown college if ever there was one. Uh, but I'm excited to watch it because I think this is this is another chance for Texas to prove some dominance here, get some get some uh little 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 movement in their sails before you uh before you go into like you know the Big 12 championship and then possibly the playoffs if, if things yeah. play out y'all way. Things go away, but, go. Are you gonna miss are you glad the rivalry's back though, Andy? Are you glad to for all of the uh, I mean, it'll be fun when the game's played, but it's not something I sat around for the last 12 years going, gosh, I wish this was happening. It, it A&M, wherever side of you sit on, A&M made a business decision that was best for them. And by and large, even if you don't have the wins to back it up financially and market-wise, brand-wise, our profile in college football has done nothing but get bigger over these last 12 years to the point that the narrative has really shifted with this Jimbo thing, because before we hired Jimbo, it was a lot of A&M needs to know their place and they need to stop trying to win. And they just need to be happy with going seven and five, eight and four every year. Uh, now the narrative is really, they gave Jimbo everything he asked for and he didn't win. That's on Jimbo. That's not on Texas A&M. Um, so there's been a shift in the perception of, uh, of what Texas A&M is in college football amongst a lot of fans in the media. Uh, I don't think that the game is going to be what it was. I'm still iffy about whether it's going to be on Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, there's a lot of people who are completely out of touch. It's not going to be on Thanksgiving anymore. 
Yeah, uh, I, I the will. NFL I will. Owns that day. Well, the day of the NFL owns that series. The SEC already gives the Egg Bowl out there, and the ratings reflect on how many people would rather be watching the NFL. They're not going to give one of their primary, uh, prime piece, prime games over to the NFL gods. It'll be played if it's on that weekend, the Saturday after. I think more likely it's in the middle of the season, at least initially, because there was a lot of fighting to get LSU A and M lined up at the end of the season. And maybe your end of the season game is Arkansas because that's another rivalry people are you know, clamoring to see in Little Rock. <laughs> Nowhere else. Yeah. Um, My eye roll. But I, I don't think it's going to be the same. Um, I, I think that AM is a lot more equal foot on more equal footing with Texas than they were from a program standpoint than they were for the bulk of their history. Um, I think Texas fans are going to be surprised at the changes in College Station, or the changes to Kyle Field, the changes to the infrastructure. Um, and, and I think it's it, it's going to have a different feel to it. The hatred will be back. Um, there's going to be a lot of people who way overreact to whatever happened on that field. But I think the day of either school changing their coach because of a loss to that rivalry, uh, I, I don't think that's a thing anymore, um, at least not for a while. There's so much more I want to get to. I think we can all agree that people that went to the uh, University of Texas at, Col- at A&M, Austin or Texas A&M College Station are going to enjoy it. People that went to Texas A&M Target and University of Texas at Walmart might not as much. Uh, this has been a very special episode of Lone Star Yell Fight. First of all, Reed, thanks for jumping on, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. And Andy, safe trip back. And eventually you and I will be back uh I think we're going to be back Wednesday of next week. No, we said Tuesday of next week, right? To preview our, our Thanksgiving week. And then, uh, I'm just happy you gave me target, not Walmart. I give, I give, you know what I mean? Uh, but this has been, this has been Lone Star Yell fight. Enjoy the weekend of college football. We will see you next week.